Hello everyone, I'm Chris Wynn. Welcome to the Walker Report podcast in association with the Sunderland Community Soup Kitchen as we turn after a three-week break to focus once again on the championship in the approach to the festive period. While we're still in the middle of a World Cup as well, which is all a bit odd, but we are scheduled to take on Millwall at the Stadium Light on Saturday, which is the rearranged game that was postponed due to the Queen passing away back in September. So to help us catch up with all things Millwall, we're very pleased to have the company of Carl Bates from BBC London. Hello, Carl. Hello, how are you? I'm not too bad. Welcome to the Roker Report podcast. How, how are you keeping? Yeah, yeah, all right. Not too bad. It's getting a bit chilly. You've got the old jumper on, but other than that, I'm all right. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm the same. I'm trying to avoid putting the heating on, but that's a, that's a different story altogether. But uh, <laughs> we just uh, talked about um, the World Cup just before we came on. But, you know, as I said, kind of being in the middle of a World Cup, I mean, has that meant you've had a bit of a break as well during this World Cup? Well, Millwall have just recently played Bromby, actually, in a friendly, which was a strange one to come up. Um, and they did fine. I mean, as you can imagine, Gary did a lot of changes, but I think it was just to keep the team ticking over, get them still playing competitive matches, albeit a friendly. We we'll saw a couple of youth players and um, yeah, we shall see how they get on when we travel north. We, we had a very, very strange experience. We, we've gone out to Dubai and we played a Saudi Arabian team and it ended up in a, in a brawl that was nearly abandoned with about 15 minutes to go. But, wow. uh, but Slight yeah, difference. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe it was a preparation for playing Millwall. I don't know. We'll find yeah. out if Millwall <laughs> a bit like that. But <laughs> I mean, just before we get into the football, I, I noticed um, that uh, you're a winner of a countdown teapot that I read, which makes you, I think, the first person that, that I know of who is the owner of a coveted countdown Teapot. I mean, does that take pride of place in the in the trophy cabinet at home? Um, it does. My wife hates the look of the countdown teapot, which is <laughs> which is of course pride of place in the kitchen. Uh, it's something I always wanted to go on. My uh, mum sadly passed away a long time ago, but when I used to come in, watch Channel Four with her straight from school, we'd watch Countdown together, and it had always been nagging away at me to give it a go, and I did. It was quite an emotional moment when I won, so I got to sit in the champions chair. Um, but yeah, no, no, it was, it was a wonderful day, a brilliant time on the show. They're really, really friendly. I was three times champion and a couple of days I won't forget. Yeah, brilliant. And I think I think it's a first for us as well. We're going to have to look through the archives, but I'm pretty sure it's the first one we've had on this podcast. So that, that that's brilliant. But uh, I mean, in terms of you covering uh, Millwall, um, I saw that you've been at BBC London for about 10 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but is that always involved covering Millwall? Uh, and actually, are, are you a Millwall fan as well? Um, well, I've co- I mean, I started with Barnet. When I first got into BBC London, I was a volunteer. Uh, there was an advert for football commentators wanted. I'd done bits and bobs on local radio, like I started on hospital radio, did a local radio show for a while on a Saturday morning, and then just threw my sort of hat in the and I threw it at the BBC and said, "Look, this is me. This is what I sound like. Have you got anything?" And I was incredibly lucky that I, they happened to ring me up one Tuesday and say, "Oh." And we're looking for somebody to come in and read out the full-time scores this Saturday on BBC One. Are you free? Um, uh, oh, I'll just check the diary. Yep, I'll come. Um, thought it was a joke. It wasn't. I went along, uh, got to meet Gary Lineker and the crew. Uh, James Alexander Gordon read them out at five o'clock. I read them out at six o'clock and suddenly my profile has gone through the roof. That's when the job for football commentator came along. I went as a volunteer um, and then after a year or so was put onto the payroll. Covered Barnet with the weird and wonderful Edgar Davids was there at a the time and then ended up working with BBC Manchester as sort of their southern correspondent. Anything lower than Birmingham, so when the likes of Bolton, Wigan were travelling to Norwich, Ipswich, because I live near Cambridge, um, that's who I would cover for them. And then Millwall were looking for somebody to do that full time. BBC London recommended myself because they knew I was doing odd jobs here, there and everywhere. Went and had a chat with them, sorted everything out. And yeah, I've been there now five, nearly six years. Um, I'm a Cambridge United fan by trade, so it's very, very strange having Gary Rowett as the manager (laughs) because I used to stand in the Newmarket Road and cheering on Cambridge when Gary played. And now I talk to him all the time and I still turn into, mentally I still feel like a little bit of a kid because it's one of of my heroes that I'm talking to just on the level. He will, hello, Carl, how are you? I'm like, yes, I'm fine, Gary, you were a legend. Yeah, so, yeah, and it was horrible when we got beat by Cambridge United in the Cup because, funnily enough, I knew a lot of people in the crowd that were letting me know that Cambridge were winning during the game. But um, you end up a Millwall fan. I've covered Millwall, like I said, for over five years now. I watch them every week. Um, You know, we see the team. We occasionally stay at the same hotels as them when we go to Swansea, Cardiff. You interview the manager, the players. You see them all the time. 
and you watch them every week, you can't help but become a fan. And so, yeah, I would say my allegiances have changed, although don't get me wrong, I will always keep an eye out to see how Cambridge are getting on. And just looking at the kind of, well, fairly recent history of Millwall, you know, in the grand mm-hmm. scheme of things, I mean, it, it's been kind of it's 32 years since we're in the top flight. I mean, yeah. you have to go back to those glory days of Tony Cascarino and Teddy Sheringham and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and kind of on the face of it, 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 you know, me just looking at it earlier on, I mean, it looks like a tough, kind of, I suppose, 20... You know that you know. There's been 21 years in the championship, 11 in in League One in the third tier. Mm-hmm. So I mean, have Mill have Millwall been punching below their weight for a good few years, or would you say for the size of the club and being surrounded by you know those kind of bigger teams in the capital, mm-hmm. yeah. that being kind of outside of the top flight is maybe a fair reflection of the size of the club and maybe some of the ambition that they've showed in that time. I'd say they're definitely punching well above their weight. Especially, I mean, it, it stands for itself. We, this season, they've bought Zian Fleming, who's their record signing ever, one point seven million. That's it. Mm. Most team have. There's a lot of teams in the championship. That's a squad player at best. There might even be a player that's gone out on loan because they're not good enough to cut it. So, I, t- to me, Millwall are definitely punching above their weight because they can't compete transfer wise. As you mentioned, the only pull they've got is London, but. There's so many clubs in London that can pay better. You know, you're up against it f- from the start. And like you said, with the history, it's not as if Millwall can call upon the glory days of an FA Cup win a few years ago or a great League Cup run or this, that and the other. So, yeah, Millwall haven't got a great history. Where, you know, if you doesn't, it's not even, you can't go back 60, 70 years and say, oh, this is what Millwall have done in the past. It's always been the same. And one thing Gary's definitely brought is stability in the championship. He's done really, really well, making Millwall very stable. Last season, only one get they went into the last game of the season with an outside chance of the playoffs, which if you'd have thought two years ago before that, you'd have you'd have been laughed out of town. They were, you know, just about hanging on to stay in the league. Yeah, I, I went just on that. I mean, because I think it was it's Millwall's sixth successive season in the championship after coming mm-hmm. back up from League One in 2017. That was under Neil Harris, and yep. in that time, I was looking, and they've only finished in the bottom half once, and they've had two eighth place finishes in the last five years. And mm-hmm. we'll get into the current season in in a bit, and kind of just how they're doing um, this season. But it's it's interesting from a Sunderland point of view because obviously we've just come up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and has the focus gone beyond just remaining an established championship club for, for Millwall now that they've had those six seasons? And is the ambition and expectation levels kind of starting to rise? Well, since Gary's coming under Neil, it was blood and thunder. Neil Harris is a huge Millwall legend, and so he should be. There's a um, big up sort of icon of him outside the ground. And, you know, he was record ever goal scorer, was manager. He's loved at the club, and rightly so. But... As a manager, he was getting found out a little bit. The team, sometimes I think he was far too passionate, without meaning to be, he was a fan in the dugout. And that went against him sometimes. While Gary's coming, and Gary is a very balanced, almost cold-blooded in the fact that he knows what he wants. If you look at his previous uh, roles at Birmingham, etc., the, the football isn't never going to be flamboyant. Millwall are never going to tear a team apart 5-6-0 and score incredible goals but he has made them very, very hard to beat. And that's why, as you say, the last few seasons, they've comfortably finished in the top half. They're an awkward... At home, they've got the best record. If you start at the start of last season to now, Millwall have got the most wins, most points. Again, this season, very good at home. And that's what they've built it on. The Den's always been a hard place to come anyway, but Gary's made it really, really solid. And away... Just recently, they're starting to build up, but that's what's let them down over the last couple of years has been that away form. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll come on to that that in, in a minute as well. But yeah. I mean, just just quickly off the pitch um, for Millwall, because I was reading a statement um, from the CEO earlier this season mm-hmm. that was put out, um, and a couple of things kind of jumped out. Um, the first, I think there was a big push for safe standing after consultation with fans. Um, that was one thing that kind of jumped out. The other thing mm-hmm. that, that stood out was re- reading that communication is... You know, it isn't, you know, that for a start, it isn't something that we get at Sunderland in terms of that communication about off the field matters. Because mm-hmm. I think it even it even mentioned the club talking with caterers to reduce the price of a pint at the ground yeah. and things mm-hmm. like that. But I mean, it, it looked to me like Millwall were in a good place off the pitch and have got owners who are looking at these small things, which actually yep. make a big difference. Yeah, um, John Berylson, the owner who's American, comes over every now and again to watch a game. Him and Steve Kavner are very 
close, they talk regularly. And Steve Caravan is not one of those people that you'll only see occasionally. He doesn't sit up in the exec boxes and not talk to anybody. Steve will quite often be seen outside the ground chatting with fans, chatting with anybody about, you know, he, he loves the club. And as you say, in, and Millwall is very much a community club. They've got a food bank. Nick, actually, if you went to the den, it's on the side of the ground and fans will quite often be sitting there handing in bits and bobs and the supporters club will put out a message before and if you come into today's game, can you bring shampoo, shower gels, soup or whatever, we're short of that. All that goes in there, the players go in there and have had pictures taken and done this and done that. They've won, I think it was Family Club of the Year only a couple of years ago. So yeah, they are very much in touch with the um, local community and I think that works both ways. So, yeah, no, they do a really good job like that. And as you say, every little helps and they will try where they can. You know, a little th- and a little thing like that goes a long way, doesn't it? You know, it, it, make, it makes you feel like a fanboy. You're not just a bum on seat sort of thing. Yeah. Like I said, reading it, it kind of jumped off the page. I was, I was quite, quite impressed with it because, like I said, it's, it's different to how it works at Sunderland. But going back to on the pitch, I mean, mm-hmm. like, like you said, um, you know, it, it's been Gary Rowett in charge since October 2019, which... Actually, for for a football manager these days, it's, mm-hmm. it's kind of probably twice as long as he's not as the normal shelf life, I suppose. But yeah. I mean, you know, eighth, eleventh, ninth, um, and you you've already touched on it. And I was looking at it, you know, from someone from the outside because I don't regularly look into no. how Millwall have been doing for the last few seasons. Can't believe. <laughs> but I mean, for me, that's a fantastic job he's been doing at Millwall. He's gradually mm-hmm. pro- progressing them year after year, and like you said, punching above their weight. I mean, is there a is there a fear because Gary Rowett's stock has been high at certain points in his career? Is there mm-hmm. is there a fear that you know there might be an opportunity where he, he might think a job comes along and he might think actually that's a chance to really you know push for the Premier League and give us half a chance even if I got there? Yeah, I think that is. I mean, with Gary in regards Millwall, he had to win over the fans first in the fact that yes, the results were better, but under Neil, for a start, he's replacing an incredibly popular man. And under Neil, it was very much blood and thunder. It was your 4-4-2, get the ball forward towards Steve Morrison. Him and Lee Gregory would sort of almost out-muscle the opposition defence. But with Gary, he, which he's done all his career, to be fair, he makes sure the team is defensively incredibly solid, makes you really hard to beat, and slowly but steadily over time makes you more of an attacking force. And the fans really didn't like that at the start of, the se- at the start of his tenure. He was doing well, they were crawling up the league, but... There was a lot of frustration there. He's won the the fans over now. They can get a little bit frustrated sometimes when Millwall do sort of shut up shop and decide, right, we're coming for the nil-nil. We might pinch one, but I'm not that bothered. If we can get a point on the road, we'll take it. Um, But no, his stock has risen. We've had recently the QPR manager disappear in North, so there'll be a position there. I'm not saying Gary's in the running or interested even, but you you worry as a fan that Millwall are, you know, around the playoffs, as you say, Gary's value's risen. And I think, you know, from what I know of Gary, he's an aspirational man, I think, you know, as he would be, as I'm sure most managers are. But hopefully he, um, with Millwall, sees a genuine chance this season. They're doing very well. Mm, Yeah. And uh, I was having a look back to the summer and the business um, that they got done in in improving the squad over the summer. And and it looked good on paper. And so obviously a couple of names on there. I mean, Benega Forby who is incredibly 29 years old now. Mm, I've always I thought, well, you know, I always think he's still a, a young lad coming through, but, yeah. but suddenly he's 29. Not sure how that happened. But there's <laughs> uh, two interesting ones in Andreas uh, Vogslammer who came in, and, and especially Zian Fleming, who's flying, yes. and we'll, we'll touch on him. But, uh, of course, um, George Honeyman as well, who mm-hmm. came in from, from Hull. I mean, so, uh, and we'll get on to, to Zian Fleming, uh, I suppose, in a bit. But um, just on George Honeyman, I mean, how is he doing so far from the wall? Very well. Um, they, you, you know what you're going to get with George Honeyman. He's like the Duracell bunny. He's got endless energy. He's always hassling other players. You know, you're not going to get a minute's piece if he's playing in the same area of the pitch you are. Gary's trying him out in a couple of different positions. He's played central midfield, but he's also played. Sometimes Millwall will play with a three in midfield, or they might even play in a four, which means that he'll go out wide. But again, that might be, when he's played out wide, it's normally to let the fullbacks bomb on. Scott Malone and Danny McNamara are both very attacking fullbacks. So if Mill will play four at the back, he tends to play more defensive-minded midfielders ahead of them. So when they go round, George will sort of drop in and there'll be a bit of cover there. So when they have played him wide in the midfield, you're not going to get the best out of George Honeyman from, I suppose, an attacking perspective. But 
he does enable others to cause the damage. So he he's one of those players you're always going to get six, seven out of ten if you were marking him in the in the paper sort of thing. He isn't going to let you down. And I mean, just just on, on this season, I mean, I imagine Gary Rowett pretty pleased or more than pleased with how things went before the break, sitting mm-hmm. sixth in the table, potentially moving up to fourth if they beat. Sunderland on, on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Um, the game before the break was an impressive 4-2 win at Preston. And I mean, in terms of Sunderland, I think the World Cup was a really good thing. Like we had a, this three-week break. I think it's been a really, it was good timing for Sunderland. But did it did it come at a good time for Millwall or, or were they just getting a bit of momentum at the time? Um, well, with Millwall, they've had good momentum for quite a while. I mean, I mean, they've won five of their last eight, drawn two. There was that defeat to Huddersfield. I don't know if you've seen it, it was just a cross that went in, unfortunately, straight over the keeper, one of those horrible ones that you see. Um, so it has come at a bad time in that sense. Millwall had, till they played Preston, hadn't scored in three games, but had only lost one of them, because as I said, Gary makes them hard to beat. So I think it's come at a bad time. They would have liked to have continued. It's helped in the fact that Captain Sean Hutchinson, a Geordie, so he'll be very popular, I'm sure, with the Maccams, um, is back now fit. So he will drop into centre defence again. So it's really good from that point of view. And Ryan Leonard, who's a very good utility player, he's a bit closer to fitness. He might be back. But with the momentum and the four Millwall were in, I think Gary would have rather carried on and then perhaps have got Sean back a week or two later. So, yeah, I don't think it's come at a good time for the Lions. Just is, is, You mentioned that momentum and they, were in a, well, they are on a good run. You mm-hmm. say were because it feels like it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a it different does. part of the season with this break. It's, it's, it's a bit strange. But I mean, where as you said, there's, he had to win the fans over. He's had those mid-table finishes. Mm-hmm. I mean, in terms in terms of the fans, where is that expectation at the minute? I mean, are, are they saying, "Yep, yeah, mid-table, that uh, we'll be happy with that. Just you know, keep us, you know, that that's kind of par." Or are they saying, "Actually, we expect to keep kicking on now that they've had those seasons in mid-table." Um, I think it's hard because as a fan, whoever you support. To be satisfied with mid-table just sounds naturally depressing, even if that's the right position for you. You know, Millwall, to f- just looking at it pure, say you were coming from a totally different angle and looking at Millwall's history as some sort of analyst, you'd say Millwall finishing 12th, 13th every season in the championship is fantastic. You tell a Millwall season ticket holder that for the next five years you're going to come mid-table and that's a great and that's great for you. They're not going to be too happy. So, yeah, an expectation, you know, Gary's a victim of his own success because Millwall are loitering around the playoffs because they are sixth could go fourth you know people get carried away you can't help it and with the run they're on at the moment CM Fleming who will come on to in a minute is on fire an incredible talent that Millwall have come across yeah you can't help get caught up in it you're just suddenly thinking is this the year Millwall can gate crash the playoffs and who knows well because we mentioned him a, a couple of times Ian Fleming um you know eight goals this season mm-hmm. I mean he he's the obvious threat because I think he's got I think he's got double the amount of the second top scorer which I can't remember who that is but C- um, Cresswell the center half <laughs> yeah, oh, well well there you go so I mean is it does a lot ride on kind of the form of Ian Fleming at the minute and is he the focal point of the team he is the standout player Millwall are now playing with a 4231 formation they were playing with a back 5 but Gary needed to liven things up and it he decided to change it to a four, which worked and has suddenly given Millwall a new lease of life going forwards. And so what will happen is they'll play normally Bradshaw up top, who has just got endless energy, just constantly putting defenders under pressure, getting Millwall up the pitch quicker. And he's the sort of foot, the frontal figure, but Fleming will play just in behind him, so middle of that three. And he has just been... Well, fantastic. I don't know if you've seen the goals, but if not, I recommend you watch them. The three goals he scored against Preston, they're three totally different goals, but show off his talents abundantly. The first goal, great strength, rolls his man, fires him from close range. Free kicks, you'll see him at the stadium. Like Before the game starts, he stays out for a little extra minute or two and tries to hit free kicks from 40, 45 yards out like a cannon. Um, his free kick, they, he was the edge of the box, just put his foot through it. He even admitted afterwards, I'm just, I just tried to hit it as hard as I could. It went straight through the wall. By the time the keeper had seen it, Millwall were off celebrating. And the third goal, if it was the World Cup and somebody scored it, they'd still be showing it now. It was just a ball in from the right. He's only about six yards out. Every player I would have thought in the championship would have tried to hit it. There's him and the defender going for it together. They're 
defender slides in to try and block the shot. Fleming just allows the defender to slide straight past him, brings it onto his other foot and just slots it in like it was messing about in training. He is something else, and I think Millwall fans know, unless they go up this season, I think Zian will be, but maybe not Millwall, because he is unfortunately far too good for the Lions. So I think it's a case of enjoying, enjoying him while you can. Yeah, he might be on the radar of a few clubs. But, yeah, uh, I'd be surprised if he's not. Yeah, you mentioned in there a few um, formation changes and a few kind of t- tactical changes that Gary Rowe's try to kind of find the best solution for. I mean, what, what do you expect uh, Millwall to kind of travel north with and how, how do you expect them to approach the game on Saturday? I think it will be the 4-2-3-1. He may change to a back three at some point during the game, but 4-2-3-1 served them very well. He has changed in goal. Uh, George Long has come in instead of Bart. Now, Bart Biakowski is a wonderful goalkeeper. He pulls off some truly remarkable saves. And I think, and I don't think George Long would mind me saying so, that Bart is a better shot stopper. But George Long offers far more from a footballer point of view. He's very, very good at getting the ball forwards quickly, which has helped Millwall on the counter-attack because him and Bradshaw will link up the ball or go long and Bradshaw will bomb onto it and get Millwall up the park very quickly. With the back four, I would imagine, like I said, Hutchinson to come back in with Jake Cooper, who's very, very good from set pieces, but he should be. He's over six foot six. So if he wasn't, then <laughs> something's gone wrong. Um, McNamara and it will maybe be Murray Wallace or Malone as your two fullbacks. Again, they'll both be bombing on when they can. Billy Mitchell and George Saville in the middle have been fantastic. Billy Mitchell's come on no end um, over the last season. He's a local lad, so they're all on his side straight away. He's a Millwall fan, brought up round the corner, so... And then, like I said, it'll be those three, probably be Vogelsammer on the right, Zian Fleming in the middle. On the left, maybe Mason Bennett, and then I'd expect Bradshaw up top would be the probable formation and the and the idea. And from an attacking point of view, Mill will sit in, but will be very good on the counter-attack. Yeah, and that, that's probably stereotypes, but um, Billy Mitchell does sound like a player who should play for Millwall. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that, if, if that makes sense. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, and just because uh, Millwall were obviously travelling north, I was looking, um, and you, you've already touched on their uh, away record, because mm-hmm. Millwall have got 31 points uh, from 20 games so far this season. Only nine of those have come away from home. And in fact, they've got the third worst away record in, in the division this season. Mm-hmm. I mean... As you said, it is an issue, but I mean, how much does that tell the full story? I mean, does that are the games themselves closer than you know what that record suggests, or do they have a real problem when they when they go away from home? At the start of the season, I wouldn't say that it was unfair. Millwall have had a horrible run. I mean, the first away games for Millwall were Sheffield United, Swansea, Norwich, Burnley, and Blackburn. Like you couldn't pick them worse if you tried. There's some incredibly hard fixtures, so. There's no surprise that Millwall have struggled on the road. They always have, as I mentioned earlier. But since that change in formation has happened, that little tweak, and when Zian got his first goal, you know, Rotherham away scored a rocket, and then Bristol City winning that, it just gave them that confidence. And as I said, you look at the last five away games, we've only lost to that cross against Huddersfield. So, yeah, hopefully times are changing and it's starting to give Millwall belief instead of, oh, here we go again on the road. It's like, no, actually, we can compete now. And if Millwall can vaguely get a decent away record, because of how strong they are at home, they will be a genuine threat for the playoffs. But I think it's their away away form that will either make them or break them this season. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of past meetings, I mean, Sunderland and Millwall haven't um, met at the Stadium United since um, November 2017, when, from memory... It was possibly the worst display of goalkeeping um, from from both teams, from two teams <laughs> yeah. on a pitch that I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, beyond that, it was um, August two thousand and three, since Millwall last did a job on uh, Sunderland at the Stadium of Light, um, because I'm not mentioning or thinking about Old Trafford <laughs> later on that season. Um, it was the actually Noel Whelan. Tim Cahill who, moment, yeah, no. Yes, that one, because <laughs> it was Noel Whelan who who uh, scored for Millwall back at the Stadium of Light. Um, but we mentioned Millwall have got the third worst away record but Sunderland actually have the third worst home record mm. in the division um, so I mean do, do Millwall fans travel north uh, this weekend with a bit of confidence that, that they can get a result this weekend? I think they will I think the fact that as you mentioned we Millwall haven't played Sunderland in quite a while I think quite a lot will want to travel because of that you know it's a new, new stadium for a lot of people so they'll want to go and cheer on the side especially because of the away form and how well they've played that'll add a few more on the door I'm sure 
And oh, I didn't even mean that to rhyme. That sounded terribly cheesy. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I can't, and I can't see why not. I think they'll be confident in themselves, irrespective of Sunderland's form. I think because of how well Millwall are playing, will be a reason for them to travel with confidence, and rightly so. If ZM Fleming's in top form, he will take some stopping. Yeah, and if if either goalkeeper catch the ball on Saturday, it'll be a better goalkeeping <laughs> performance than, than the last time we've, we played there. But uh, yeah, I mean, looking at the table, only four points between the two sides, and and given that you know this game is you know both sides kind of game in hand or on the pretty much the rest of the division, mm-hmm. and looking how tight the table it is, I mean, it could make a massive difference to either side if they take all all three points, mm-hmm. um, because it feels like a great chance to make ground on the teams above while while nobody else is playing this weekend. Yeah, and especially for Millwall in the fact that the two games afterwards are Luton and Watford. Um, and you've got Wigan in there as well. So you'd be liking to think if they can get something at Sunderland, and don't get me wrong, I'm pretty sure Gary would take a point, again, away from home, the way Millwall are. And as you say, it's, it's an opportunity. It puts pressure. I'd always rather have points on the board putting pressure on the others than chasing with games in hand. And so with that, you know, make it to your advantage to have the game earlier than the rest of them. So, no, I, th- I think it's a great opportunity for, for both sides to sort of put their mark down early and then everybody else can worry about it while Millwall and Sunderland can sit back and watch how the rest get on. <laughs> That's it. Are you, are you travelling to the uh, Arctic North this weekend? Are you travelling? Uh, I wish I could. I am really, really annoyed. I had, because of the World Cup, was supposed to co- cover everything so there wouldn't be a game until the 10th. I booked a whole, a long weekend away with my wife. And, of course, then Sunderland Millwall brought it forwards. <laughs> and guess which is the only ground I haven't been to in the Championship? <laughs> Correct. And I've got a friend up there who I used to work with. I was going to meet up with her because I haven't seen her in years. Uh, Dan Godfrey, who works for Sunderland, now used to work for Millwall. I was going to catch up with him. They're going to make a weekend of it, etc., etc. Oh, no. No, so I'm away with the wife, so don't play this because that sounded like I really didn't want to. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but why couldn't that have been Wigan away? You know, that one, I could, I could live with not. I've been there a few times. It wasn't great. But no, so unfortunately, no, I won't be travelling north. But I will be keeping an eye out. I will be listening in somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, to be fair, I mean, I know, you know, there's a long way to go yet, but chances are you might have a chance next season as well. But uh, mm. we'll, 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 have to, we'll have to wait and see how the rest of the season pans out. But on that note, it just leaves us to say thank you very much, Carl. It's been an absolute pleasure and um, all the best for the season ahead. Yeah, you too. Always good to chat football. So thanks for having me on. Maybe we'll we'll meet up in the in the return fixture. We'll see. We'll see if it gets to the business end. It's getting interesting. But thanks again, Carl. <laughs> Cheers. No problem. And uh, thanks again for everyone for listening. Keep a look out, Rock Report, for all the build up ahead of the game against Millwall at the weekend as the lads return to action. And keep an eye out on all the usual places in the next pod. It should be dropping very soon. But from us, it's bye for now. 